Welcome to Wine for Normal People, the podcast for people who like wine, but not the snobbery that goes with it. I'm your host, Elizabeth Schneider, author of the Wine for Normal People book and certified wine dork. And I'm MC Ice, just a wine-loving normal person. This podcast is sponsored by our exclusive sponsor, Wine Access. And in honor of my absolute favorite holiday, Halloween, we have put together a four pack of amazingly themed wines that revolve around Halloween. Go to wineaccess.com slash WFMP dash Halloween. Listen in the middle of the show for more details. This show is really special to me. It is with my friend, Marina Marcarino, who was originally on the show in 2017. I've seen Marina in Piedmont several times since then, and we've become better friends. And I look to Marina as the absolute thought leader in so many things, in wine styles, in environment, in climate change, in thinking about new things that other people aren't thinking of. Marina Marcarino was originally billed as La Pazza, the crazy. If you go back and listen to episode 182 so many years ago, you will hear her story, and I do encourage you to go back and listen. Although she was called La Pazza for being the first one to be biodynamic and to be organic and for trying new things, everyone else has now come around to her viewpoint. And the things that she says today, I think in another six years, she will come on the show again and many of them will have come to bear. I talked to her about all sorts of things in this show because I really wanted her take on what's going to happen in wine, what's happening now, and where do we see things going. So I think as you listen to the show and listen to Marina, remember, as she talks about these things, they are things that are likely to happen and things that people are likely to talk about in the future because there's no one else I know in the industry who has more of a an oracle's perspective than Marina. Please seek her wines out. They're available. Punset is her brand, P-U-N-S-E-T. The Barbaresco is unbelievable. The Barberas are delicious. The whites, the Arnaise is fabulous. Barbaresco will likely be the one you'll be able to find, and it is definitely worth your time. The spiciness of it, the reflection of the land. Marina is a real master. And as she says, well, you'll hear her analogy about the cake. Just keep listening and you'll understand why her wines are much better than a lot of other people who work in the same way that she works. I hope you find this as fascinating as I do. I always learn so much when I talk to Marina and I'm so happy to have her back. Now let's get to the show. Marina, welcome back. So let's talk about what has been going on over the last six years since you have been on the show. First, let's remind everybody about your story and how you pioneered organics in Barbaresco. Thank you, Elizabeth. It is always a pleasure to speak with you. And thank you for this invitation as well. Okay, my history for the one that uh, are new. In 1982, I started to work organic. This practice was uh, absolutely unknown and new for our region. I was very young. I was doing something funny for, for uh, those people, so I've been named the crazy. And this was my nickname for a long time. In 1990, I started to work uh, biodynamic, as I think that there is... Uh, always a connection between uh, our planet uh, and the universe and uh, the energy that we can get from the universe is very important so we can say that our uh, estate is 100% biodynamic because we are not self-sustainable but we practice as much as we can this kind of agriculture and in the same year so with the biodynamic methods uh, I uh, wanted also to express at the best the typicity and uh, the characters of our terroir that I think is the real value of our territory. And to do that, I also decided to start working natural. Working natural to me means ferment our grapes only with indigenous yeast, to add sulfites only before bottling, and keeping the wine as much as possible in their natural life. So no no additions, uh, no filtrations, uh, but at the same time, uh, I don't want to be in that narrow corner of the crazy extreme <laughs> organic. <laughs> I am not a Taliban of organic <laughs> because I think that we must respect the pleasantness of uh, a product. And I always make a very funny example, speaking about a cake. We can make a cake using the best flour, the best fruit, 
organic and eggs coming from uh, chicken, super organic. So we put everything together. We make a fantastic cake and we put it in the oven and then we burn it. <laughs> and when we burn it, we, we can't say, okay, it is good because it is organic and because it is natural. We must say it is unfortunately a burned cake that was supposed to be a good one. So for my wines, I don't want it to be in the condition of the burned cake. And for that reason, our guys are trained to respect this product and to make it in the best way without adding anything, but keeping it very clean. So starting with this natural way of working, I also went through the Fukuoka agriculture. This practice started in our state in year 2007 with a little part of it. The Fukuoka agriculture is basically considered the agriculture of not doing, but actually not doing doesn't mean not doing things, but it means not to create any disturb to the biosystem. And so to respect the biosystem, to leave the plants uh, living in synergy, also with what grows around them. Because what is growing around them, it is always a support. So uh, the Fukuoka agriculture is the opposite of the modern agriculture. And for sure, visiting our state is uh, a sort of uh, little wood where you can see a lot of vegetation, uh, sometimes also uh, creates problems because, uh, you know, the inspectors uh, are used to this uh, sort of garden that uh, has nothing to do with the real agriculture. So our vines are considered like a human being, respecting their own energy. They are pruned, they are worked uh, in relation to what is their own potential. This allows to maintain a better health and to spray a little less. You are La Pazza. You are crazy. Even in 2017, you were still on the forefront of all of this. What changes have you seen? You are no longer out of the mainstream. You are the mainstream now. So the question is, how have things changed with the attitude? And what about climate change and how that affects, how do things adapt? Because since 2017, all this stuff has changed. And now, like I said, you're not out of the ordinary. Now you're the vanguard. You led this. For sure, um, we are facing new screens. Since 2017 to now, uh, in these uh, six uh, years, uh, we have seen the climate continue to be hotter, drier, especially in our area where we are really suffering. I am uh, hearing, um, you know, of solutions that are very strange, like to try to water our vineyards. But the, the, where, where can we take the water? And uh, on the other side, I also discovered uh, with this new weather that um, plants are able to adapt. They adapt. For sure, adapting, they manage in a different way. And again, we are back to the uh, human being. It is so hot, they can't work as much as they can work with a lower temperature. So we should consider lower production. We need to face a different kind of illness because uh, maybe not the ones that uh, suffer humidity, but uh, we have other problems because uh, the hot uh, is going to burn a little the skins. Uh, and, uh, and so what was supposed to be the best solution to clean the vines uh, a lot, now probably is the worst solution to clean the vines a lot. And for sure, it is something that now is taking over since a long time. 2003 was considered you know, the exceptional year, and now... Every year is a thousand tree. We know these. Uh, uh, there are very funny um, informations, like uh, 1982 was considered a very warm vintage. 2014 was considered a very cold vintage. 2014 was hotter than 1982. And now we are used to this weather. You know, we are October. And we are wearing short sleeves, uh, no socks, uh, mm -hmm. in Le Lange. When I was uh, at school, we were wearing gloves uh, and uh, coats, uh, and the fog was uh, cuttable with a knife. I think that it is not only agriculture that is suffering. I think that everything is suffering. And we have to do something, and very quick. 
very, very quick. We don't need to stay watching at the window because it would, I'm sure it will be too late. And I think that is also a question of education because, you know, the temperature is increasing, but we are doing nothing for not increment this temperature. We are used to heat our rooms a lot in winter. We are used to be very chilled in summer. So we put outside a lot of steam. And this steam also uh, is a part of the atmosphere that uh, changes. On top of that, we need to have more woods. We need green, because green is the only solution. And for sure, it's not very comfortable sometimes. Because uh, to be a farmer means to, to face also difficulties. Probably would be better if uh, in the total strategy, in the, also in the political st strategy, we could push a little in that direction. And uh, forgetting a little the economy, because uh, you know, the economy doesn't work if uh, we are going to die. You're somebody who has been ahead of all of this. You've been ahead since the beginning. Your vineyard looks totally different from everybody else's and your soil is healthier and I think your plants are healthier despite all of this you look around Barbaresco and it's much smaller than Barolo so you are in touch with people much more than Barolo Barolo it's a third of the size you've been there for a long time you've always been 10 steps ahead of everybody else let's just face it you are what specific production methods have you taken on because i've been to your vineyard and i've been to other people's vineyards and it seems like even though yes you're suffering you're not suffering as bad as other people because you've figured out something that other people haven't figured out one thing people always ask me is like is there even going to be any nebbiolo in the future is it even going to be able to grow here what is the answer to that I think that uh, we will keep having Nebbiolo. And uh, of course, uh, there are big differences in the vineyards. I should say that our vines uh, this year uh, didn't suffer so much the temperature because of the grass, because of uh, the quantity of leaves, because of the wood behind us at the bottom of the hill. At the same time, I should say we had less production because also the healthy vines adapted and they knew that it was very difficult to grow so many kids. I always consider that they are like, like we are. So we must do our best for maintaining them fresh. And the only possibility is to leave them covered with leaves, with grass, taking the risk of a lower production bigger competition for sure there is a bigger competition with all this vegetation but uh, on the other hand we know that we are not going to have cooked grapes on top of that uh, we need to maintain the life of our vines the biggest problem in with this uh, situation is for the young vines this is a big problem because the roots are not so deep because you can't leave the same quantity of grass around them, otherwise the competition is really too high. And it is very difficult in this moment to raise a new vineyard in a normal time of three, four years. You need five, six, seven years because they are slower and a lot more of end work because you must just keep the vine clean, allow it to have a protection, but at the same time, not too much competition. So we have this problem. To me, the biggest problem actually is, uh, is the one that we are not able to manage the water as it was because we are missing the snow and we are having storms never had in the past. Can you explain what a water bomb is? <laughs> a water bomb is like uh, in 20 minutes, the rain of one season. Very strong. It's really new. It's something that is happening like since two or three years. And we also had the, the snow bomb this year. The only snow that we got was at the beginning of December. And uh, in uh, like 20 minutes, we got 40 centimeters of snow. Everything was paralyzed, blocked, because, you know, not expected such a quantity of uh, snow in once. And the day after, we got 18 degrees. So it was spring. And that snow was absolutely unuseful. Because the, the soil was too dry and the so not able to, to take the water. And as the temperature raised up immediately, all the water went unuseful. 
and we had uh, the Christmas day that was like uh, May. So it seems like as you go around to different parts of Europe and look at all of the climate change, I have to say this, Piedmont is the one everyone talks about. I think you're being hit worse than anyone else. This is the crucible of climate change. I worry about Piedmont because I don't even know, like, what about Dolcetto? Is it, is it going to be cool enough for Dolcetto? Is it going to be too hot for Barbera for it to make balanced wine? These are the kinds of things where I look at Piedmont. And then when I'm thinking about Piedmont, I really legitimately think about you because if anyone is going to solve these problems, it's going to be you and whoever else is like you to make sure that there's continuity. How much more can you do? And then you you do not want to do work in the cellar to make this work, right? So then it's got to be in the vineyard. Okay, I think that people that are controlling the agriculture need to change the mentality and give informations and instructions to stop using herbicides, to stop using practices that are only able to warm the soil instead of refresh it. Last year, last summer, uh, with a friend who also worked uh, more or less in my style, uh, we made a, a trial, checking the temperature in a vineyard with grass like mine, and in the next one, that was only soil, clean. In our land, at 8 o'clock in the morning, the soil was 24 Celsius. That soil was 46 <gasps> Celsius. So can you imagine at noon? Oh my gosh! And uh, this is a real proven that we can do something because that freshness is also able to refresh the planet. So we need that green. And uh, we also need that uh, the, those people that are controlling agriculture in Italy stop to think that uh, the old modern agriculture is the, is the only key. Right. It's not the way. Now is not the way anymore. And uh, is not the way to make a big volume. Of course, we must consider that the cost will be higher because less is the production, higher is the cost. But do we prefer to have something good? Do we prefer to protect our planet? Or do we want to only have cheap stuff to take and go? I think that what we must do and can do is working on, on the agriculture side, only on the soil because the soil is the solution. We should stop this story that is not allowed to have trees in the vineyards, because this is a stupid fact. And trees are protection. Trees are also a signal for some pathologies that could be important. And they offer also support to the vines. Of course, we must live living spontaneously. In these two years, we had to cut oaks that were growing in our vineyard. But if oaks grow in a vineyard means that they must be there some way, the lot of room that they have. So I'm not sure that uh, just listening to the new agronomist, uh, we can find the solution. We must uh, consider a little more what our ancient said and look back because maybe they never got temperature like the, the one that we are living now, but they expertise a lot of things, a lot of different options. And we must go back to the past if we want to go ahead. That's really interesting because that's what I'm also seeing at all of the most progressive people all around. They're all going back to the old way of doing things. So maybe that will help a lot. How is the market for Barbaresco? One thing that we see in the US, which I don't know whether it's true, is that young people are drinking less and there's all this. Have you read about all of this? Is that happening in Italy also? And if so, is it, Wines like yours that gross Pinot Grigio from the train and that's saying that they're not drinking. No, there is a different approach, I think. Um, at first, there is a problem of communication because, uh, you know, now uh, alcohol is considered something like super dangerous, but they put together wine, spirits, beer. Right. And this is, in my opinion, a big mistake. The result is that young people are drinking less wine but they are drinking a lot of spirits. It's much more dangerous for our body, for our life. However, on the other side, there are small sections 
of young generations that are more and more interested in wines made in a certain way. So that are interested in nature, that want to eat and drink organic, uh, that go deep and try to know who is behind the wine and not the label. And this is a new generation that needs to be some way educated. You know, we must start again teaching. Teaching not to drink, but to drink properly, to drink quality and uh, to understand what, uh, what they are putting thing inside them. I did this this week with my workers. You know, my my seller has a peculiarity. I have a very young team. My oldest worker is 31. So it's a super young team. And uh, summer, hot, they are drinking these, uh, no alcohol drinks. I can't tell the name now, but there is one very popular. So they forgot in a glass this drink for one night. The day after, the glass was uh, completely dirty but we couldn't take off the color so i went with this glass to these guys and said listen what do you know what we put here do you know that what left this sign goes in your stomach they stopped drinking (laughs) from that day they are drinking mineral water but you have to prove something we see a lot of illness and we don't know why but no one cares or what is putting inside we care a lot of what we wear, the shoes, the bag, the brand. And people are spending money on that. But only a very slow percentage of people pay attention to what he's putting inside of his mm-hmm. body. That's the problem. So sort of like slow food? Yes, yeah, sim- similar too, but even a little more of local communication. It would be important to explain in the schools. In Italy, we have a very bad program on food education in general. In France, they work a little more on their own uh, typical products. So wine is uh, still standing. And uh, I think that in Italy, we would need to have someone that starts to understand that wine, if drunk properly, could be something positive and not something negative. We, tr- we gave our son, since he was a kid, the habit of tasting. He always tasted all the wines that we had in our glass. He never got drunk. And now he's 25. And still now he drinks very well. And many times he says, Mom, I don't go out to, uh, for dinner this, tonight because this group of friends drink very badly. And if I have to take the right bottle, we always fight. So I prefer to eat home and then <laughs> meet them later. So there is a section of young people that has, uh, you know, interest in doing well and drinking well. We must do a little more. I think people are starting to realize that, that it's really on wine to think about these things. Also, I think in Italy, it's a little disappointing because we always think of you as being the pillar of wine, the one that is going to defend wine until the end because it's such a part of the culture. We didn't talk about the MGA system the last time. I would like to hear what you think about it. This is the Mencione Geografica Agentiva, and it makes things more complicated to explain to people, but it also is great for some things. I feel like the rollout from the consortio is very, very difficult for at least as a, on the education side. They did not do a great job of educating people. Do you think this is a good thing or do you think, OK, if we're thinking about going back to the past, Barolo and Barbaresco are blended products from all over the communes in large part. And now we're thinking, OK, now we're going to be more like Burgundy and we're going to do these individual areas. Is it good? Is it bad? Like. It is a nice question. Mm, you know, when we decided to map the area, the Barbaresco region was the first in Italy to do that. Actually, we already had this division, not exactly the same. And uh, the name of this uh, MGA are actually the name of uh, spots of hill that had some peculiarity, making them different from others. Of course, uh, something has been added to make everyone happy, but this is always how it works. And uh, the main one are historical. I remember my grand-grandfather still saying, okay, that place uh, is named 
maybe because before a certain Mr. Rabaya was living there and he was uh, working in the vineyards uh, or doing things in a certain way. What I think is that uh, it is very difficult to communicate something without giving a base. So when I have people visiting my winery, normally I don't show the winery because I think that the winery is a working place. We don't need to have nothing special with tanks because otherwise we can't make the wine. But what I take time to do is to give a deep lesson, explanation of our territory and how it is so different from here to there. Knowing our history and giving the, the consumer the possibility of knowing where the wine comes from, then it is much easier to understand the MGA system because you already get a vision of what is La Langa. To speak about I don't know, Brunate or uh, Canubi or I don't know what, Le Rocche di Lamora is beautiful in terms of name. But it is very difficult to, to tie this to something. Except money. I'm not yes. sure because at the end you also find wines getting on the market from these areas that are not expensive. It's not a quality system. It is a territory system. Okay. That's the big problem with the rollout is that it's a terroir system and now people still call it crew. It's really, really difficult. And I'm going to segue this by saying that I was very surprised to see that you decided to become the president of the Alvesa, which can you explain what you do in your capacity as that? Because it really is a regional body and you're so different for this region. Okay. Alvesa is a consortium of producer tied to the use of the same bottle, which is a territory bottle. Actually, the idea of being president in there was something that I never decided, <laughs> but it came. It happened that uh, Alberto Cordero di Montezemolo, that was uh, the president before me, before finishing his, uh, his time, decided to stop. So we were in a, a difficult moment because uh, a president that leaves him behind is uh, always a problem. And so no one wants to get over because uh, they didn't know what could, could have left. And I said, okay, I was in that group since I was young. And I said, if it is for a few months, I will do it. I will bring everything to the end and then we will decide. And then it happened that I am still there uh, five years uh, almost. We got to the COVID, uh, we had big troubles with glass but we also did a lot of good things it was funny because at the beginning I also was watched like that strange person that is going there you know I look like being much tough than what I am really and so they were all afraid but I am lucky because uh, the the team is very um, is very productive I'm very young and so we put rules because I always put rules this is my big mistake maybe but we put <laughs> clear rules and it worked very well. So we did, in these times, a lot of things. And we are very happy to have done that. The two ones that we are really proud of are the um, protection of the truffle treasure. We planted uh, into the estates of our partners, so with the members of the consortium, we planted more than 2,000 plant, uh, trees of uh, um, varieties that naturally grow here. Yeah. So not pines, mm -hmm. but oaks, hazelnuts, uh, and uh, others, uh, these are able to have uh, uh, white truffles spontaneously. And we decided to repopulate those areas that, you know, with the new vineyards have been cleaned up. And I think this is an important project for our environment. And then we decided to protect uh, the Collezione di Grinzane Cavour, which is uh, this uh, historical, uh, let's say, experimental vineyard which uh, uh, is a, a sort of library of uh, viticulture with more than 500 uh, different vines varieties uh, that are disappeared and they are preserved and uh, kept alive. And we also are making experimentation together with the, the CNR. What is CNR? CNR is the National Center of Research for Vines and Agriculture. They have a base in Torino at the university. And together with them, we are supporting this uh, experimental vineyard. And now we are making some experimental 
winemaking on varieties disappeared, but uh, that we would like to bring back to life because we think that they are better resistant to the weather. And this, I think, it is an important uh, investment for the future, for our, for our work, but also for the entire system here and uh, for, sh- for the territory. And these are the two projects, the two main projects that are out of promotion because normally El Baiso takes care of uh, promoting the, the wine and the territory and now we just uh, opened uh, our new head office uh, downtown Alba uh, where we are going to propose um, tasting experiences without selling wine. We will not sell anything. We will just sell the experience of comparing the difference of Dolcetto from Diano, Dogliani, and uh, to understand why we have different Barolos. So we want to teach people. Do not forget, if you are loving this podcast, the Wines of Piedmont class is on this Saturday. It is coming up and it is a class for people in Europe and the U.S. It's a daytime class for U.S. folks, an evening class for Europeans. And we are going to talk a lot about this show and all of the other insights that I gathered while it was in Piedmont. So make sure you get on it, winefornormalpeople.com slash classes. I'm also offering the Wines of Burgundy food and wine pairing, wines of Australia. Check it out today, winefornormalpeople.com slash classes and join Patreon. And then you can go on trips like this trip to Piedmont where I was able to meet with Marina to do this show. It is patreon.com slash winefornormalpeople for as little as a bottle of wine a year. You can join the community and it helps keep us going. If we didn't have Patreon, the show would not exist anymore. We thank our patrons so much. And I hope that you'll think about supporting the show and joining. And I also hope that you will check out wineaccess.com slash WFMP dash Halloween and get on the four pack of spooky, scary wines that we have put together. I love wine access and their sense of fun. We thought about what my favorite time of year is and I will post the picture of my house. My house looks like a carnival. I love Halloween. The wines that we have picked out are so awesome. We have an old vine shed in a Tasmanian devilishly good Chardonnay. Yes, harking back to that podcast that we did recently, a ghostly Cabernet and a dragon inspired Pinot. If you're going to have a little Halloween soiree or just drink wine while kids are coming to trick or treat, this is the wine for you. Wine Access thinks of everything. Great educational information, tasting notes, stuff about the winery, about the region. And they also have free shipping when you hit $150 threshold, which is really not hard to do. They have wines of all prices. And as soon as you hit that $150, you qualify for free shipping and you have up to 30 days to do that with their buy and hold feature. Go to wineaccess.com slash WFMP. Check out the Halloween pack and start thinking about the holidays too. They've got some excellent wines. You might as well stock up now. Get on it today. Definitely check out that Halloween pack. These wines are to die for. (laughs) Now let's get back to this amazing show with Marina Marcarino. What's the difference between Albeza and the Consorcio? Even I'm a little bit confused about the differences between them. And what I will also say is that you're doing, I think what you're saying is you're doing more than the Consorcio. And there are a lot of the young producers who have inherited properties from their parents I've heard, I haven't heard about them complaining about you, about Albeza, but they do complain a lot about the consortio and how there's a lot of competing interests, but the people that always win are not people like you. It's always all the big names win all of the praise and press and all of the opportunities. What's the relationship between the two of you and how do you make sure that people like you, it's a little bit ironic because the people on the consortio side often give favoritism to the big names. You are not a huge name. You're running Albeza. And so like, how do you protect? Do you know what I'm saying? I I mean, how do you protect these young people? Okay. I think that uh, first of all, it is important to to explain what is the consortio. Consortio uh, Barolo, Barbaresco, Alba, Lange, Endogliani, this is the name, but we said it, Il Consortio. It, it, It was actually founded to have 
the possibility of protecting and uh, uh, controlling the, uh, our appellations. So this is the main thing. If we have to decide uh, a change in, in the discipline, uh, we can do it uh, through the consortium without uh, uh, having the risk of uh, um, some people from the minister that come and know nothing about the territory and take the decision. So in this side... I think it is a very important instrument that we have in our hands. So it's a legal thing? Yes, it is something legal. It's something, you know, it is like to have a head office for doing our stuff. I think that uh, what is done inside of the consortium is done in this way properly. Then, with the time, there was also a promotional side. And the promotions, uh, we know, uh, sometimes uh, are not good for everyone. So... I understand that some investment uh, could could be um, felt uh, not proper for the general shape of our winery size. And uh, I could agree. I could agree because uh, I think that sometimes it is much important uh, to grow here for announcing outside that going outside to try to bring in. We also have a, a, an economic fact, yeah. a finance, because, uh, you know, probably, that uh, uh, Europe put at disposal money for promotion. The fancy fact is that uh, we can use that money for promoting outside of Europe. While sometimes uh, our products uh, must be known because they are here. So I would invest a little more bringing people here instead of traveling there. Bringing people, explaining letting them visiting, giving special tasting as a teach tasting and not just, okay, we have a sip of wine with a carne cruda, with a tornato, and okay, because this is not the, the right way to propose. Unfortunately, as always, big companies are big investors. Small companies have less potential. So we must consider this in all what the consortium is going to is trying to do. Then it really depends uh, on the person that is in charge, you know, the, the main seat. I think that uh, sometimes uh, this person has to make de decisions that are always difficult because in one side is pushed politically, you know, the consortium is not Albeza. Because Albeza is a private association, is a consortium, but we have nothing to do with the public. If our consortium decides to do something, we don't relate with the minister, with the regional headquarter. We do something, we inform, we have our own investments. Sometimes this investment can be better, you know, for some varieties. We, we invested a lot of money with Nebbiolo Prima, which is focusing on Nebbiolo. And uh, of course, uh, in Albeza, we also have wineries that are not making Nebbiolo. And this is even one of the reasons we decided, let's make a showroom. Let's give all the wineries to have the possibility of having them wine tasted and uh, trying to make a different uh, tasting approach. We haven't the same problems. And when Albeza decides to do something, like we decided to go in America for promoting the bottle... It is because we want that uh, people understand that Albeza is not a brand. Albeza is a bottle that only contains quality. Because to be part of the Consortium Albeza means uh, to have a certain good reputation, to be accepted by the whole com wine community and to have an history of wine. The fact that the big brands have a big weight. Okay. I think, uh, yes, sometimes. I also think that it's more something that we feel. Personally, I was never scared of speaking with the Gaia. We have, we have a good relation. Sometimes we discuss, sometimes we also fight. With uh, Elio Altare, you know, they are all people that more or less were on the wave when I started. So I should respect them. I should respect them because they did a lot of work. And the uh, we can't uh, like uh, or dislike their products. So that's something different. This is a personal taste. But in my opinion, in the Barbaresco region, we must uh, say thank you to Angelo Gaia. I don't disagree with you. We can respect them and honor them. But what would happen if you had done that 
And then you decided not to do the organics because that's not how things went. I mean, you are a completely different person. You're a maverick. That's what you do. And we have this whole younger generation that looks at the names you just mentioned and they think these guys are still running and it is guys really are still running our region and we can't get anything. We can't get into this at all. And you don't even agree with a lot of the things that they say. It's not that I'm saying you should, we should be disrespectful, but I know it's really important to you because look at your team and and you're completely willing to change with the times. You are so different from a lot of people in this region. And yet you're in this position now where you have to reconcile the interest of someone like Angelo Gaia and the people at Rati. It's such different interests. I don't know how you do that. And then how you look at people of your son's generation, who some of are, who are coming up and get it all together. Let me give you an example. So Albeza. Albeza, the biggest thing is the bottle. Anybody listening to this, if you go into any Italian wine section anywhere, you will see Albeza on the bottle. It actually is imprinted on the bottle. Well, what about bottles? I mean, now we're having all of these debates about sustainable packaging and lightweighting the bottles. And do we move to something else for younger wines? Not all of your wines can be, the Barbaresco obviously should be stored for a long time. And we're going to talk about your wines in a second, just to remind everybody you should buy Punset wines. But the point is now, what do we even say about that? All you think about all day long is, is earth. So then here we are and you work for the, I don't know, you know, it's complicated, but I know I'm looking at your face and I know you think about these things too. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'm thinking to that. As a matter of fact, uh, with Albeza, we are studying uh, to have a bottle with a lighter weight since a while. I mean, we are on study since uh, year 2020 and we are trying to find a solution. Uh, yeah, there is a problem. Mm, I think uh, to produce glass uh, is uh, a planet problem, but also to produce other materials is a planet problem. Right. What I think is that people sometimes also has a wrong mentality because they think that from the container you make the product, you give the, the quality to the product. Right. And this is mistaken. I am totally against to this aluminium container because... I don't think that they are good, in particular for the conduction. So, you know, metal, they heat very fast. They get the energy through very, very easily. The, the positive fact of a glass that is quite neutral. So being neutral uh, maintains the quality for a certain product. Probably is not the same for the cheap drinks that could be maybe in anything, papers, uh, even bulk. If we speak about bulk wine... People going to buy bulk wine thinks to have trash, so they don't, they don't want to pay. So sometimes we built the story of the container. What we are trying to do with Albeza is, to, on one side, to make a program of working with a low-weight glass and little by little convince our associated that is not necessary to use a 700 grams bottle. We still have a lot of wines in 700 grams uh, bottles. I remember when, for me, I decided uh, almost, uh, when, when we had the first light albeza, 450 grams, I decided to put all my wines in that bottle, also the Barbaresco. And uh, I remember some of our importers, they were saying, why? This is a lightweight bottle. And they say, yes. And what the wine is always the same. I mean, you have the wine, you have the glass bottle, you have the cork. So what is this? People like to have, to feel the way. Thanks God, little by little, people are not uh, anymore on the idea of having 100 of glass for drinking one, one glass of wine. We was, must work on this. We must work uh, on the idea of recycling. What about bottle washing? Have you looked into that? Bottle washing, we, we tried to consider that. We made a calculation of the CO2 impact for picking the bottles, bringing back to a, a site, wash them with hot water and steam and redistribute. And at the end, the CO2 impact is higher than making new glass. Wow. And it is something that we don't consider. Because now we also think that recycling is always the best solution reusing more than recycling. Sometimes 
it is better recycling. So what is very positive for glass is that you can recycle our bottles the Albeis are 70% of recycled glass. Only for the extra white, it is uh, unfortunately a, low, a lower quantity because of the problem of the color. But thankfully, extra white is also a very small. Clear? Like a clear bottle? Clear. clear. The one that is... Well, it's not good for the wine either. Mainly used for, uh, for uh, grappa. They use it for, for distilled stuff, grappa. And so it's a very small production. And uh, can I get back a little to the younger people? I want you to, yes. I have to say th- something. I've been young. I've been a young girl starting making wine with uh, only a few big... You know names. I we call them the 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 kings or the uh, the sun shining. You know, and it is normal that we see these people and think, okay, they are still there. People are still drinking that. However, we must think that to raise that place, they worked a lot. So I disagree a little with these new generations that think that because they starting to do something, they should be immediately under the lights because even doing your best you have always something to learn what to me is sad is to see that this group of young people don't like to communicate with older generations Mm. they are their own groups with their own ideas and with their own flags it is very important to speak to know to learn and to connect maybe with that, they, it would be even easier to understand how those people reached that position and how they made it possible for the new generation, especially for the new brands, be there. Don't you think the young people are scared? Like, it would be really scary to talk to Angelo Gaia. I don't know that I would. Why? Why? He's a person. Well, for you... Angelo Gaia is 30 years older than me. More or less. But, you know, if you don't try to to find a connection, you will never have a connection. So I remember my first time at a consortium meeting. Okay, I was 20. The president was Gigi Rosso, who is not with us anymore. Many people was sitting there, were sitting there. A old man was sitting on his side. And we were speaking about, uh, I don't remember exactly what, but something about the, the discipline of making wine. And I said something. I tried. I was at the end of the, of the room with my hand on. I said something. And that old man that was sitting in front turned to me and in a very strong dialect told me, what would you think to understand? That you are a girl and even a woman? And I was like shocked. So at the end, I went to Gigi Rosso because I knew Gigi Rosso because his sons are more or less my age. So we were at the same school. And he told me, yeah, but you know, you had to tell me because what you said was right, but you are the youngest in this room. It would never been, have been accepted. So coming through me, and I was very nervous. So I went to that old man and I told him, you were not nice with me. Because if you want uh, to have a renewal, you must even accept that someone says something stupid. And uh, maybe it's stupid or maybe it's useful. You never know. So, my name is Marina, and I shake, I decided to shake his hand, and it was like this. After, like, two years, that man came to my winery, and he told me, I need a suggestion from me. (laughs) Yes. And it was something regarding the, the market, I don't remember what. But after that, we became very good friends, and he was 53 years older than me. So when we started chatting, he was 73 and I was 20. Wow. And when, uh, before dying, he wrote a book and I was the first that he signed. But it is not to say, okay, I'm good. I say, it is difficult sometimes to speak with all generations, older generation. But if you try without uh, thinking that because they are in that position, they don't want to say nothing. You have already lost. We need new generation with energy, with volunty of doing. But to do things, you must know the past. We are always in the same place. If you don't know the past, you can speak. And about the press, another question, another fact. 
you know, we speak about the big stars, uh, the big journalists, the big writers and the scores uh, and all this story. But we are building these people, able to judge our work. So if we stop giving value to those people that come to the winery and say, okay, but you must change your way of making the wine. You, you sh- Yes, you should change the wood. And then maybe they also write that this wine was nasty. They give you advice? Many of them manage this way. Giving suggestions, uh, you should do this, you should do that, you should, yeah, from the past, you must use barrique from this brand, you must use uh, the machine, crashing machine from this brand. Crazy. And one time I had to do with one of the, these and I told him, listen, why don't we try a, a little game? I sit your chair and you sit my chair. <laughs> and let's see what happens. Try, try. Because it is very easy to speak using someone else's money, someone else's land, someone else's product, someone else's life. Because if I make a production and it is mistaken, how can I live? I can't go to the writer or to the journalist that gives the scores. And then we know it's true. There are some brands that are not judged in a team because otherwise they are not in the same position. But they invested a lot of money. Leave it them. How many bottles they can stole from the market? The market is big. We need to communicate, to open new markets, to do things, to have to do with new generations. You know, my son is 25. My son doesn't read The Spectator, doesn't read The Parker, Wine Enthusiast, or whatever, or The Canter, or because if he buys his wine, he can't afford that wine. So he will never care of a bottle that costs $250. And how many bottles cost $250? We have a lot of good wines. So it is important that we make a good wine and we will find the market, especially for the young people. Okay, so let's talk about your wines. So it's been six years and I want you to remind people, Marina makes beautiful Barbaresco, but you also make a number of other wines Have you added anything to the portfolio? Have you done new things? You're always innovating. So if you think about where you were six years ago and where you are today, talk about some of your wines, highlight some things that you've been doing. And of course, please talk about your Barbaresco so that people know you are distributed in the U.S. so people can get. You're in the U.K. also, right? Canada? Yes. Australia? Yes. Even in Australia. Actually, I feel like a listener wrote me after hearing our last show and said that they were able to find you in Australia. So talk about some of the changes because you're just always finding new wonderful things to do with your wines. The new change with the pandemic was not to leave my workers at home. So I decided to renew some old vineyards of Cortese and Favorita, and we planted Nascetta. Of course, the wine is not on the market yet because this year we added a few bunches of grapes. Cortese is the famous grape of Gavi. Favorita is Vermentino. But tell us about Nascetta. What is Nascetta? Nascetta is a, is a traditional local variety that was disappeared and brought back to the life like 15 years ago. Not typical of Neve. In, it was uh, born in uh, Novello. However, it was always grown in the, in the region. So it is a white variety. It is interesting because you can also have wines with uh, some of structure. So not very simple, not a Pinot Grigio at all. For these few years, uh, this year and the next, uh, maybe two, we will still have a Lange Bianco and then we will have a Nascetta. So the project is there. For the current wines, uh, we just because we were speaking about the young people, a new generation, we are focusing a lot on a Lange Rosso, which is a blend of uh, Dolcetto Barbera and Nebbiolo. And this is a wine that we propose especially for uh, aperitif, uh, for wine bar and so on. Very pleasant, not too difficult because uh, we, we need to give a welcome to our region. This is our welcome. And then our one of our flag is the Barbera, uh, our Barbera d'Alba, because, uh, because I think that the Barbera is one of the most expressive variety of the region. I like it very simple. Simple in terms of natural in the style as the wine should should show. 
we don't use wood on that. It is uh, fermented in cement and kept in cement, uh, early bottled. Is the cement coated or not coated? It's coated. Because in the U.S. and other markets, they're using unlined cement for wines. Yeah, but I don't like it so much. No, it, because of the pores that are too strong, the, con- the contact with the sand is too high, so you miss a little of color, the oxidation is faster. I like cement because uh, of the lower conduction, because uh, of the possibility of maintaining the wine fresher or cooler uh, depending on the, on the on the season without the biggest shocks but the direct contact with the cement i think it is a little too much for our wines mm-hmm. maybe for other wines is good you i have no experience for the barbera for instance you lose a lot of the fragrance if it is in direct contact with cement while i like a barbera crunchy that that put people together and uh, and enjoys this is more or less the idea of this wine. And of course, uh, we focus on Barbaresco because uh, because it's our our treasure. And uh, we make two Barbaresco from two different MGA. They are really different. So this is, uh, in my opinion, a way to understand the MGA because the Bazarin is a very traditional Barbaresco. The land gives uh, traditional Nebbiolo and with the fine tannins, uh, very direct, with a very con- good continuity between the first approach at the nose and what you get as aftertaste. Then we have a single vineyard from the area of uh, San Cristoforo, where we make these few bottles, because they are less than 5,000 bottles yearly, uh, with a vineyard that, that has like 75 years of age, and a very limited production per hectare of 12,000 square meters we make less than 5,000 bottles. Here we use always a long time of fermentation, but not as much as for the Bazarin because tannins there are stronger. And so we don't want an extraction too deep. The peculiarity of Punset, I believe, is that we never release a young Barbaresco. So our wines got get to the market for at least after at least five, six years of aging. So this year we released the 2016 Bazarin and the 2015 Campo Quadro. After three years of wood aging and three years of butter refining for the Bazarin and 42 months of wood for the Campo Quadro. And it is on the market since the 1st of September. Uh, Why this? Because I think that... uh, Nebbiolo is not a, a, an easy variety. It is difficult to be understood. I know that uh, everyone is becoming a little more of a connoisseur. I can even see, say that after my experience, I see many people that at the first impact with Nebbiolo are shocked. So I can't ask my, my consumer, listen, buy the bottle and keep it uh, three or four years and then drink it. This is my work. My job is to bring... Uh, wines that are already understandable with a great potential for the aging. So even if they are five, six, seven years old, it doesn't mean that they they are at the end of the life. They are just starting their own life. And they can promise that if properly kept, they can live at least 25, 30 years. The number of people, and again, I don't want to trash your colleagues in Barolo, but the number of people that say that they prefer Barbaresco to Barolo, at least in the U.S., and actually, a lot of people in the UK say this too, is rising and rising and rising. Barbaresco, in my opinion, most people who really, really love Nebbiolo put Barbaresco above Barolo, which I don't think used to be the case. I'm wondering if you're seeing that too, or whether that's just something that I have definitely observed it. And any time that we have this conversation, sometimes people are afraid to say it. And then I'll say, well, I prefer Barbaresco to Barolo. And then people say, oh, really? I do too. Are you seeing that? I hope you're seeing that because I feel like Barbaresco, it's risen a lot. What I see is that uh, finally, we are not anymore the little brother. Probably changing the communication we got a different approach because, you know, before we were speaking about the king and the queen, the king and the prince and so on, while Barbaresco as a, a sort of old identity hmm, that people were not understanding because speaking about queen and uh, king and queen, we are speaking like something about 
first level and second level. So now with the identity, people have a different approach. They start to taste this wine, to understand this wine. I also think that there is another fact that supported the Barbaresco in the last years. The fact that Burgundy had problems. So the problem, main problem was the, the, the prices started to raise so much. People started to watch around. And as a, a style, Barbaresco is more in a Burgundy direction compared to Barolo. So probably we also started to be appreciated by those consumers that were only drinking French. And then I always think that nothing like chat advertising, speaking. I tried this and it was good, so oh, let's try it. And for sure we see that the Barbaresco now is received in a different way. Mm -hmm. We still have a little problem in terms of, of price because you know there is still the idea that because it's not a Barolo, the price should be cheaper. But uh, I think that we will get out of this as well. It's really interesting that you say the thing about Barbaresco and Burgundy because Nebbiolo, we were talking about the press before, when the Barolo boys and that entire movement happened, Barolo got put in with Napa Cabernet and with the bigger styles of Bordeaux and these huge wines. And the fact is that Nebbiolo is basically Pinot Noir with tannin. Even Barolo is not as big as any of those wines. Tannin does not necessarily make a wine heavy. These wines are beautiful. The Nebbiolo grape is not Cabernet. Can you speak to that really quickly? Because I think that's another thing that people need to understand your comparison to Burgundy is because Nebbiolo is like Pinot. Yes, for sure. Uh, the fact that while uh, Barolo boys were focusing on a certain level of consumer, so they had to reach the, the standards of some wines varieties, maybe um, change completely the, 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 the face of, of the Barolo because of the you know, for a few years, uh, we had Barolos on the market that were super fat, super heavy, super bodied with a lot of wood. Now we're getting back to normality and uh, getting back to a personal identity because, uh, thankfully, the market uh, grows a little and uh, is able to understand. So now, um, yes, there are some strong wines, but if I wanted to have a, a, a super big wine, I drink a Cabernet. I drink a Super Tuscan. Right. If I want something from Italy, we have a lot of Super Tuscan because the investment was done in Tuscany thanks to Ornellaia, Solai and so on. For the Nebbiolo, if I drink a Barolo or a Barbaresco or a Roero or a Nebbiolo, I am looking for elegance, for uh, deep sensations, for fragrance, for, uh, you know, uh, the possibility of having... Uh, so many different experiences in one glass, which is nothing to do with Cabernet. Cabernet is a very interesting first big shot. Good. So I tell people, try to taste uh, these wines with the idea of getting an experience, a sensation, and then take a note of the sensation because we are not all the same. So everyone is going to get a personal experience from a wine. Maybe from an Ebbiolo wine, it is a deeper experience. That's mm -hmm. the fact. Marina, as usual, you just wow me. You are one of my favorite people in wine by far. You are so interesting. Everything that you have to say, all of your ideas are always fresh, always new. You're always thinking ahead of everybody. I just really appreciate you being here. I appreciate your friendship. I love that when I come to Piedmont, I can see you. Please go out and seek out Marina's wines, Punsit, P-U-N-S-E-T. And I will also, of course, it's the title of this show but we'll put all of the links and everything that you need in the show notes too. Thank you so much, Marina. And with that, this has been another episode of Wine for Normal People. Thank you so much for listening and we will catch you next time. <laughs>